a four-dimensional intergalactic spectacle produced by some of the most innovative and influential creative minds in the history of cinema, starring the biggest pop music artist in the world, possibly in all of history, at the peak of his fame, supported by Disney at the beginning of their journey back to total industry dominance, part Star Wars, part Thriller, part Tron. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Captain EO. Thank you to Native for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code SECRETGALAXY3 for over 33% off your order of 3 deodorants today. Look, I consider myself an expert on a lot of things. Action figures, the history of action figures, collecting action figures, storage and display of action figures, but I would never call myself an expert on deodorant, even though I smell like one. That's because Native takes care of that for me. With 72-hour odor protection, they're made with clean, simple, and effective ingredients that are aluminum and paraben-free. Native is vegan and cruelty-free. And with so many scents available, Native can take care of that for you, too. Eucalyptus and mint is my everyday go-to. It's clean and fresh, like a walk through the woods on a cool morning. But sometimes I'll go with these citrus and herbal musk for a hint of fruity sweetness. Don't miss out on the new scents being released all the time, like the limited edition Fall Escape collection with vanilla and cactus flower, desert grass and sandalwood, or my current favorite, sage and sweet citrus. 3 deodorants would normally be $39, but if you use my link in the description below and code SECRETGALAXY3, you'll get them for $27. That's over 33% off. Again, that's code SECRETGALAXY3 to get over 33% off your purchase of 3 deodorants. And thanks again to Native. Captain EO is a 17-minute live-action film slash four-dimensional theater attraction that ran from 1986 to 1998 at several Disney theme parks around the world. Produced by George Lucas, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Michael Jackson. Undeniably, it was humanity's greatest single artistic achievement up to that point. With respect to music videos. Captain EO is the captain of the starship, uh, we don't ever get the name of the ship, probably not important. What is important is that the ship is crewed by a daring cadre of elite rebel specialists. Idy and Odie, the two-headed, three-legged pilot, Hooter, the elephant in the room, Major Domo, the security officer and physical host to Minor Domo, a smaller flying robot, and Fuzzball, the, uh, Fuzzball. They are members of the Corps, reporting to Command. Traveling across a galaxy called the Cosmos, they are good warriors in a battle beyond the stars against, uh, you know, evil, on a mission to bring freedom to the countless worlds of despair and, uh, look, everyone on the planet has seen Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Everyone knows what's going on. After their last mission went sideways, they're anxious to get back in the good graces of the Rebellion. To redeem themselves, they're going to deliver a gift to the evil cybernetic spider lady known as the Supreme Leader, who lives on a planet made out of Death Star trenches. That gift is a key to unlock the beauty trapped inside her. If they fail, Major Domo and the rest of the crew will be turned into trash cans. If they succeed, the entire planet and every living creature on it will be transformed by the light and love of magical rainbow lasers and the power of Captain EO. In 1985, Michael Jackson was the biggest pop music star in the world after his 1982 album Thriller broke all the sales records. The corresponding 1983 video for the song Thriller helped mainstream the idea of music videos altogether and pioneered a subset of music videos that were produced as mini-movies. Together with director John Landis and a half-million-dollar budget, they produced a 14-minute short musical film about werewolves and dancing zombies that resulted in sales of over $30 million, and won three MTV Video Music Awards in 1984 and a Grammy for Best Video Album in 1985. Jackson immediately put his unprecedented fame and talent to work in an effort to literally change the world for the better by not only participating in but co-writing We Are the World with Lionel Richie as a charity benefit for African famine relief. Meanwhile, new Walt Disney chairman and CEO Michael Eisner was looking for ways to jumpstart the company's return to prominence after years of declining park attendance and box office disappointments, including 1979's The Black Hole and 1984's The Black Cauldron. 1982's Tron was a technological marvel pushing nascent computer imagery to its limits, but got de by hits like E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Friday the 13th Part 3. With attendance lagging at Disney's theme parks heading into 1985, Eisner wanted to engage multiple branches of the company in a show of force to reset the public's view of what Disney was actually capable of in terms of cinematic spectacle and innovative theme park attractions to give people a reason to come back to the parks. Fortunately, Eisner knew Michael Jackson personally. Jackson was a big fan of Disney and frequented the parks. After the overwhelming success of Thriller as both a music video and era-defining pop culture moment, Eisner reached out to see if he wanted to work on a similar project for Disney Parks. You know, Michael Jackson is a Disney aficionado. Knows more about Walt Disney than anybody that ever existed. Certainly knows more than I do. And uh, we called up and we said, Michael, would you like to do something with the parks? 
He said, definitely, but only if you can get George Lucas to protect me. Lucas had a reputation for attention to detail, for creating industrial light and magic who pushed the limits of visual effects technology, innovating solutions where none existed, for lending his visionary eye to everything from character design to dialogue to sound and visual design. For choosing the right people to write and direct Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi because he was busy working on Raiders of the Lost Ark and also because he didn't want to. Lucas agreed to join the project as executive producer, despite already being committed to his next science fiction epic, Howard the Duck. Jackson hoped that maybe Lucas could get his good friend Steven Spielberg to direct, but he was in production on The Color Purple and had to pass. Concerned about Lucas's visionary eye being overcommitted to ILM and Howard the Duck, Disney brought in Rusty Lemoran to act as the in-person, on-the-ground showrunner. Lemoran was a producer on Barbra Streisand's 1983 film Yentl, as well as writer and producer of the 1984 film Electric Dreams, about a personal computer that gained self-awareness after being doused with a bottle of champagne. While Lucas wasn't able to get Spielberg to direct, he did bring in another one of his friends, Francis Ford Coppola. Despite Coppola's reputation as the award-winning director of 1972's The Godfather, 1974's The Godfather Part II, and 1979's Apocalypse Now, his recent work delivered fewer Oscars and he was on the verge of bankruptcy. He was more than happy to get the call from Lucas for whatever the project was. Lucas, Jackson, Eisner, Coppola, Lemerand, a whole lot of cooks in line for final say, few if any, were concerned with what the actual story of the thing was. Obviously, there's an evil empire opposed by a swashbuckling space hero and his ragtag band of rebels fighting back with industrial light and music. For a time, the show was called Space Nights until Coppola observed that Eos meant dawn and light in Greek. The word resonated with the concept of Jackson's hero of light sent to transform the darkness of evil. The S was dropped and he was given the rank of captain to give it a pseudo-military feel. Production design came straight from the hits of Broadway. Costumes were designed by Tony Award winner John Napier from Cats and Les Miserables. Choreography came from Jackson himself as well as Jeffrey Hornaday who worked on both A Chorus Line and Flashdance. The Wizardry of Lucas. The Mastery of Coppola. The Phenomenal Music and Dance of Michael Jackson. Captain EO. In spectacular 3D. Now playing at Disneyland and Walt Disney World and nowhere else in the universe. Creature design and visual effects were produced by many of the same people who worked on the 1984 hit Ghostbusters. It was Jackson who insisted they lean into the dark mechanical horror of the Queen and her cyborg minions, drawing inspiration from the works of H.R. Giger and his designs for 1979's Alien. To bring the evil queen to life, they initially cast Shelley Duvall. In 1980, she starred as Olive Oil in Robert Altman's Popeye and Wendy Torrance in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. But neither of those films required the type of makeup prosthetics that Captain EO did. The claustrophobia induced by the facial casting process in order to create the near full head appliance proved to be too much, and the part was recast with Angelica Houston. A lucky break for the production as Houston's Hollywood stock went way up during production. Her performance in 1985's Pritzi's Honor would eventually win her an Academy Award for Best Actress, which, according to Lemerand, quote, if she had an Oscar before we hired her, I'm sure she wouldn't have done the job. The biggest draw for Captain EO was Michael Jackson. In very distant second place behind that was the 4D visual effects. What are 4D visual effects? The first two Ds are the flat screen, which represents storytelling in the X and Y axes. The height and width, this is common for standard movie theater presentation. The third D, or dimension, is the ability to utilize the Z axis through the use of glasses with polarized lenses, allowing images to appear to have depth. The fourth dimension in some art forms is time, but in this case it refers to the coordination with in-theater practical effects like lasers, fiber optic lights, and smoke, and that's not cheap, especially when a brand new theater had to be designed and built from scratch to accommodate it. Music was a critical component to the film. Cashing in on Michael Jackson's fame meant giving audiences the number one thing they expected to get from any attraction starring Michael Jackson, new music from Michael Jackson. Other than We Are the World and the chorus on Rockwell's Somebody's Watching Me, fans hadn't heard anything new from Jackson since 1982's Thriller, and while that was good, the thrill wasn't going to last forever. Jackson composed two new songs, We Are Here to Change the World and Another Part of Me for Captain EO. The rest of the music was composed by James Horner and Tim Truman. In theater pre-show, music was written by Richard Bellis. Coppola completed principal photography before handing the project over to the assistant director and the rest of the crew to fill in the gaps. 
and there were a lot of them. Turns out a film that didn't have a clear narrative from the beginning resulted in a film without a clear narrative at the end. Things were so bad that the crew deliberately avoided showing any of the completed footage to Eisner for as long as they could, for fear that he would know the true scope of its potential failure. To be fair, all of the creative visionaries carried their own share of the blame. From Lucas's obsession with minor adjustments to the visual effects requiring major redesigns and reshoots, to the fact that Coppola had never shot a film in 3D before, which requires much more precise lighting that takes longer to set up in order to make the effect work. Construction of the 700-seat Magic Eye Theater took longer than expected, there were more visual effects shots than expected, and Michael Jackson lacked the commanding presence of a big screen hero. His voice was so soft that they wanted to modulate it, and he put his hands on his crotch so many times while he was dancing that the editors just gave up trying to hide it. Eisner was not happy, but there was no turning back. When production ended in May of 1986, its original budget, estimated at around $11 million, had grown to an estimated $30 million. 17 minutes of film had cost roughly a dollar, a dollar 76. <laughs> That's cheap. You can get that deal. You take that deal. I take that deal. <laughs> What's this show cost? <laughs> 17 minutes of film had cost roughly 1.76 million per minute, making it the most expensive film ever produced on a per minute basis at the time. The only way to save the project was to finish it and hope that it was still good enough to bring people to the parks. Originally planned to open in spring of 1986, post-production dragged on for so long that the premiere was pushed back to September, kicked off by a star-studded premiere attended by stars like Jack Nicholson, Dolph Lundgren, O.J. Simpson, Janet, and LaToya Jackson, but not Michael. Captain EO was heavily promoted across media, including a behind-the-scenes documentary hosted by Whoopi Goldberg, featuring actual footage from the finished film. Without the 3D and 4D effects, of course, still the only way you would have been able to view it in any capacity outside of the theater at Disney Parks. Captain EO's branding was slapped on all manner of merchandise available throughout the parks. Pins, shirts, trading cards, stickers, keychains, watches. You could get plush dolls and PVC figures of Captain EO's crew. It was adapted into a 3D comic book by Eclipse Comics with art by Tom Yeats. When the reviews of Captain EO hit, several critics looked past the dazzling visual effects, the music, and spectacle to conclude that there was no substance underneath. The LA Times said, quote, No one expects an amusement park diversion to be gone with the wind, but given its production team credits and the film's lavish budget, audiences have a right to expect more than empty flash, end quote. Producer Rusty Lemerand addressed the delays, budget overruns, and reports about drama behind the scenes by saying that, quote, Nobody knew the nightmares and the delays we would encounter. I don't think any of us would have done it if we had known. But as much as Michael, George, and Francis are known as innovators, the technology of this kept them more like happy children in a playground, end quote. Disneyland kept its doors open for 60 hours straight for Captain EO's premiere weekend. They sold $2 million worth of tickets to the park, with 93% of attendees saying that Captain EO was the reason they were there. Regardless of a compelling narrative or artistic merit, Captain EO succeeded in becoming a hyper-localized phenomenon. The two original songs Jackson wrote for Captain EO were eventually released outside of the film itself. Another Part of Me was released in 1987 on the Bad Album one year after the opening of Captain EO. A shorter edit of We Are Here to Change the World was released in 2004 as part of Michael Jackson. Jackson, the Ultimate Collection. Captain EO was a Disney Parks exclusive show, partially to get people into the park, but also because the full experience couldn't be duplicated outside of the Magic Eye Theater. You had to see it in person at either Disneyland in California, Epcot in Florida, Tokyo Disneyland in Japan, or Disneyland Paris in France. That said, it did air once on MTV in 1996, and never again after that, officially. It has never been released on VHS, DVD, or Blu-ray, but as of this video, you can watch it and the Whoopi Goldberg-hosted behind-the-scenes documentary here on YouTube. Like Tomorrowland and Epcot's vision of the future, Captain EO's effects and overall aesthetic quickly became outdated, left behind by newer technologies, newer filmmaking styles, and newer, more popular musicians. Captain EO was, by design, a product of its time. Michael Jackson was integral to its success, and therefore Captain EO was vulnerable to the ups and downs of Jackson's fame, susceptible to the negative effects of tabloid-generated scandals, and the tragedies of Jackson's personal and professional actions. Through the 90s, Jackson found himself in court defending against accusations of abuse. While he was never technically found guilty, the effect on public opinion didn't require the same burden of proof a courtroom did. Both Epcot and Tokyo Disneyland closed their Captain EO shows in September of 1994, replaced with the 4D feature Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. They were followed shortly thereafter by Disneyland in 1997 and Disneyland Paris in 1998. Michael Jackson died in June of 2009. His death kicked off a wave of nostalgia for the music and persona of Michael Jackson fans had fallen in love with through the 80s, including that time he was a spacefaring superhero fighting against the evil cyborg empire. Captain EO returned for a limited time beginning in February of 2010. It was promoted as a Captain EO tribute to set the expectation that this wasn't going to be the full 4D presentation. Rather, it would utilize the effects that were still in the theater after the transition to and from 
Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. By 2015, Captain EO was once again closed, once again on the heels of abuse allegations in 2013 and 2014, once again with the court of public opinion and the Disney boardroom finding him guilty enough. While that seemed like the end for Captain EO, it might not be the end. Just this year, Justin Simeon, director of Disney's Haunted Mansion, expressed interest in rebooting the EO franchise for a new generation. If they can make three movies about the Haunted Mansion, they can make one about Captain EO. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind the scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. And let us know in the comments down below if you had any experience with Captain EO in person. Did you actually get to see the show in one of the parks? Nope. Did you own any merch? Nope. Did you even know it existed either at the time or before watching this video? Yep. My only connection to it is having my own memory jogged during the writing of this video. I had completely forgotten that at one point I owned a Captain EO watch. It wasn't so much a watch as it was a watch-shaped bracelet with a hologram of the Captain EO logo on it. Hard to say that I miss it since I forgot it existed for 40 years. <laughs> Cut.